Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Managing Sales Change, Overcoming Roadblocks to Sales Success. My name is David Goodstein, and I'm the webinar coordinator for the Outsourcing Institute. It's our pleasure to be the co-host of today's event with Three Forward. I'll be working in the background to help answer any technical or general questions that you may have. But before we begin, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few tools you're able to use throughout today's session. We encourage you at any time during the presentation to submit your questions to today's speakers. To do so, click the questions box, type your question in the space provided, and click the submit button. Your webinar is be, uh, this webinar was being recorded, and you'll be receiving a follow-up email in approximately two days, which will include a link with today's recorded webinar and presentation slides. The webinar recording and presentation slides will also be available at outsourcing.com. So before we begin, I'd like to quickly say a few words about the Outsourcing Institute for those who aren't familiar with us. Uh, the Outsourcing Institute is a professional association dedicated to providing independent best practices, tools, roadshow events, and networking opportunities for all forms of outsourcing. Located at outsourcing.com, we have 70,000 members globally. OI specializes in providing low-cost and no-cost alternatives for outsourcing buyers in need of RFP tools, vendor selection assistance, training, as well as general support and coaching. For those of you who are in this market, we offer an array of very targeted sponsorship and promotional opportunities. Our sister company, CMS, provides recruiting services for those seeking to hire outsourced professionals experienced at buying, selling, managing, or consulting in this arena. Contact information is at the bottom for those who have any questions. Uh, also, I'd like to tell you about an upcoming event we have coming up for the Outsourcing Institute. We have our Wall Street Tech Conference show on March 13, 2013. And it'll be covering what is known as T5, sourcing, cloud computing, big data, mobility, and security and compliance. To find more details, please visit outsourcing.com slash events. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, Dan Hudson, president of 3Forward, and Matt Smith. He's the vice president of 3Forward. So I'd like to turn it over to them now. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David, and good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's day is going, going well. Just as a little bit of background on 3Forward before we get into today's presentation, um, our company is a, a sales consulting company whose focus primarily is in the sales strategy and the sales planning arena, and more importantly, uh, focused on building uh, demand generation and lead generation programs that provide a steady stream of highly qualified leads to your sales team. Matt Smith and I have uh, collectively probably 30 or 40 years um, or more in experience in, in managing, building and managing sales teams that are selling to, selling through, and selling for outsourcers. So we're very familiar with some of the challenges that are faced with uh, the folks that are on the phone today. And with that, I'm going to let turn it over to Matt Smith and let him get started with today's presentation. Matt? Thanks, Dan. Um, Dave, why don't we go to, to uh, slide six, and we'll get, uh, we'll get into it. So the the way that all of us used to sell, um, and I say all of us, Dan just indicated we've been at it at this for a little while. So let's you know roll the clock back 15, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. The the concept of selling was very much relationship based. Work in your Rolodexes, uh, work in your networks, and 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 you know using a lot of what's now called old school styles and approaches to engage with with potential buyers and educate them about what it is that our companies did and how they might benefit from taking advantage of it. And so if you fast forward to where we are today, there's there's sales has become a very technical and very process driven approach to to driving companies' revenues. A lot of what's caused this change on the has been on the buy side and it has to do with um, internet uh, empowerment of buyers and their ability to self educate themselves and take themselves through the buy process on their own. We call it a self serve model. <clears throat> and some symptoms that you may you may recognize in your organizations where this this change has happened, but you haven't been able to keep up. If revenues are flat or or declining, if it's becoming harder and harder for your sales organization to win new logos, to get outside of your current account base, and and win relationships with companies that you don't know today, <clears throat> if you have a whole lot of lots of, of no decisions in your sales pipeline, all of those conditions are symptomatic of. The, the buyers have changed the way that they're engaging. Your company has not yet changed in response to that to, to address the, the new approaches. So we're going to spend the rest of the deck talking about tactics to use to catch up and hopefully get in front of, of the changes that are occurring and um, you know provide you some education hopefully along the way. So um, David, why don't we go ahead and hit the next slide. 
So hopefully this is not the first time that you've seen or heard this kind of a, of a uh, description. We're showing you a, a definition of by-process, and, and some of you may be familiar with a, a um, consultant analyst uh, named uh, Ardith Albee. She's done a lot of research on by-process, so this is her diagram. Um, but what's been shown is that if you're trying to sell to organizations in a status quo stage, um, win rates in that environment can be as low as 1% to 2%. And basically what that means is that company, everything that they have, as far as they are concerned, is working fine. Um, they, they don't feel a need to go automate or change anything. They don't feel a need to try new CRMs or outsource something that, that today is working correctly for them. What changes, though, is when a priority shift occurs, and, and this is, it's not something that sales can make happen. This is a, a change inside that business that whereas today, you know, they come to work in the morning, everything is fine. They walk out of a 10 a.m. meeting and everything is not fine. Some sort of priority shift has happened. It could be, for example, uh, they just found out that, that revenues are, are declining much faster than they thought, so they have to address that. It could be the company has decided to make an acquisition could be that software solution that they used to have suddenly doesn't accommodate the way that they want to market to their clients. Point is that priority shift has occurred and now they're going to be in a research mode looking for solutions to that problem, trying to decide you know, what, are, what are the approaches that I can take to address it, what happens if I do A or B, what happens if I don't do anything. Um, so the, the, the time to be found, the time to engage with a company is when this priority shift occurs, when they're in research options. There's been some studies that have shown if you can engage your organization at that point, at priority shift and research mode, your win rates can be as high as 30 to 60 percent. If, if you don't engage with them until they start to look at options or step back in their process, your win rates drop to 10 to 15 percent at best. And some symptoms of that would be an RFP process. So think about it, the company's done their research, they know the vendors they want to talk to, they probably even have an idea of what the solution is that they're looking for, so they put out an RFP to test it and validate it. By then, if you're just getting the RFP, you're way late to the process. So the point is, how do we get found at priority shifts? So David, let's hit slide eight, the next slide. So this, this funnel represents a couple of things. It shows the, the new selling process, but it also shows from a marketing and a sales perspective what happens in each of these stages. And all of this is to be found at that priority shift point in a customer's environment. So to make that happen, you have to have a strategy to, to be there in the first place. So, and it can't be we sell our services to anybody in the world, that everybody's a prospect. You have to, to really make sure you've honed who it is that you're selling to, not just in terms of industries and segments, but within those companies, who is it that you're trying to reach? Who are the influencers and decision makers and, and the enablers and so forth? What are the, the triggers going to be to those individuals specifically? If they go to Google and, and type in a, a search phrase, what might they be typing? It probably won't be your company's name. It's going to be a, de a description of the problem they're having. So how do, you, how do you know what that might be and be found if they're doing searches like that? Then you can turn that information into a strategy to, to create leads from those, those activities that prospects are doing. And this is where you start to get into aspects of content marketing, which is a term that you'll, you, you have probably heard. Um, if you haven't, it's certainly one you need to become familiar with. But um, content marketing, um, website content, um, social selling, all, all these are the things that are happening um, as you move into this next layer. Um, and, and execution of all this is creating and sustaining content that is relevant to buyers at different stages. And, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. But creating and sustaining that, that content, engaging with leads, not just when you think they're ready to buy something, but on an ongoing basis so that they, they become accustomed to who your organization is. Ideally, they're saving some of the materials. You might be emailing out newsletters and white papers and links to, to webinars and, and educational resources that they tuck away in a folder so that when that priority shift happens, they go, ah, I, I got an idea who I need to go take a look at. And they go back in, into their inbox and look for your message. Um, lead scoring and analysis so that when they do, when, when your messages get open, when people download items from your site, you, you know that that's happening. You're scoring those engagements. You're looking at that at, at, 
at the activities as they're moving across your, your website and you're starting to make some assumptions about where they might be in research process. And all of that needs to happen above what, what is the traditional sales funnel. The traditional sales funnel kicks in from lead qualification down. And this is where your normal sales stages of opportunity identified and proposal delivered and best and final delivered, all those stages are happening in the, the bottom portion of the pyramid. So that what this hopefully is conveying to you is there's a whole lot of activities that need to occur in the, the, the blue area above the, the traditional sales funnel. So David, let's go to slide nine and look at, <clears throat> okay, so if the, the former slide is what do we as sales and marketing do on a tactical basis, this slide is, is what we need to be aligned to in terms of what buyers are looking for. And, and the point here is a couple things. Buyers are looking for different information as they're going left to right through, through the different stages. So it, in other words, when they're at priority shift in research, it's very general information about the problem. They're not yet ready for brand discussions. They're not re yet ready to be told that you're the best. What they're trying to do is educate themselves. So content that they're looking for that you can provide as sales organizations is what's in the bottom section here you know, research studies, reports from analysts, give them an idea of what trends are, give them an idea of what others in their industry are doing. Um, testimonials start to become important as you move to the next stage. Um, when, when buyers get to um, options, things like scorecards or calculators, assessment tools become more and more valuable. It's not until you get to later stages where they've really in their minds solidified what their problem is, what they think their solution is, and they're starting to, to make decisions about, do I want to go with vendor A or vendor B? And that's where brand comes into play, and that's where references potentially come into play. So to, to make all this work, you have to have a couple things in place. One is you have to have content on your website and in your sales organization's hands that aligns to each and every one of these, these buying processes. The other thing you have to have is marketing automation that allows you to reach far more people at any one time than sales reps sending out white papers from their email could do on their own. Marketing automation is what engages buyers, it, it scores their activities, it sends them auto follow-ups, it encourages them back to the site after a couple of weeks of, of absence. It's, it's the only way in today's model that you can engage at, at a very high volume level and, and yet still be very customized to particular personas and to particular needs of, of the targets that are in your database. So um, let's take a look at the next slide. And let's presume that we've done all these things correctly now. We've got content marketing in place. We've got marketing automation. We're, we're getting inbound leads. We're getting found from, from companies that previously didn't know who we were. So search is working. So now what do we do inside our organizations to make sure that we're, we're perfecting the selling process? Because this is the other area where organizations can really affect a lot of change and, and, and uh, drive revenues. So the first thing that you have to ask yourself to, when you're whiteboarding your end-to-end -end sales process is do we actually have a sales process to whiteboard? And unfortunately, a lot of companies, when they, when they start to put pen to paper, this is where they realize, you know, we really don't have a true sales process that's formal and dynamic and documented. It's kind of, you know, one team does it one way or one rep does it one way and another rep does it another way. And, and that, you know, so whiteboarding it is a good way to, to really find out, do you have a sales process to optimize or, or are you looking to put one in the first place? Um, the, you know, the next point is no sacred cows. So challenge every aspect of how you sell internally and externally and, and look for roadblocks or obstacles that are slowing down the process, either slowing it down for your sales team or making it difficult for your customers to engage with you. And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't pass that test, then change it or get rid of it and, and do it quickly. Um, let's look at the, the next slide, David. So with a process in place, the next piece is build a sales plan on top of that. Um, and sales plans to, to Dan and me are, are very specific documents. It's, it's, it's got to have the, the, the traditional, you know, is, is, are my goals measurable, are they specific, are they actionable, and are they date-oriented. Um, you have to be fact-based, and you have, to, you have to build a sales plan that's attainable. Um, if, if, you know, when we're at that time of year where most of us probably already have our numbers given to us or we, we've accepted or agreed to our numbers, but if, if the, the executive team has 
decided that the company has to grow revenues 15% this year, minus erosion. Um, you, have you done the math to know how many deals you have to win by quarter, by size, to be able to make that happen? That, if you've done that number, that math, you'll know how much sales pipeline you need at any given time of, of year. Have you done the math on what kind of sales cycles do we expect and how is that going to impact our pipeline? We may have what looks like enough pipeline, but if our deals take 12 to 18 months to occur, do we have the ability to, to make the 2013 revenue goal that was established? Um, another important thing to look at in, in sales planning is the throughput of the sales team itself. So it, it's one thing to decide what a growth target is and to, to layer that across the sales team. But have you done the analysis to, to say, for example, my sales reps today get one proposal in front of a customer every other month. It, it, to make the number that we've set, they would have to be able to double that. They'd have to do one every month. Well, some companies look at that and go, well, there's no way that's going to happen right now. So you know, a sales plan addresses all of these challenges, and it looks at the numbers top to bottom so that you know not just how you're going to get there, but where you need to invest if, if you have challenges in the organization to, to make those changes necessary to have a chance to, to hit your number. The other thing, um, David, let's hit the next slide. That we, um, We're very big advocates of once you've built your sales plan, build measurement methodologies, dashboards, that allow you to track progress against that sales plan in a lot of different ways. And, and so here you see some examples that we've designed for clients of ours that are charts that show them on any given point. Um, and we recommend no less than monthly, and it, it would need to be more frequently if your sales cycle suggests this. But no less than monthly, look at where, where your organization is in terms of your targeted pipeline, meaning the pipeline that you, you want to have to hit your number, versus what your actual is. And if you built it out right, you'll see for example, well, we have enough deals in the early stages, but when we get when we get deeper into our pipeline, it starts to drop off for whatever reason. The the only way to really see that is building a dashboard that gives you the, the ability to, to look at it like this, and ideally not just in a table format, but in a chart format as well, so so that the, the differences in stages really start to pop out. We also look at things such as average uh, stage value. Um, and look and see if there's consistency in your sales pipelines from early stages to late stages. Um, that, that becomes an important measurement to look at. And finally, pipeline aging, which is one area that, that often gets overlooked, but a, a pipeline aging report will tell you a, a couple of really important things. It, among other things, it measures pipeline velocity. So do we have deals, not just enough deals in the pipeline, but are they moving fast enough through the pipeline to allow us to close them in time to, to have revenue impact? The other thing it'll show you is if, if you have deals stuck in certain stages, um, if you know what your average sales cycle is, let's say for, for example that it's six months from time that you identify an opportunity to the time that you get contract, that's your average. If you see opportunities in your pipeline that are twice that, so in other words a year old, the, the percentages that those deals were, will ever close is less than 10%. They're, they're probably coded incorrectly by the sales rep who's hoping and wishing that that deal will come back to life or they don't want to they don't want to look exposed and take it out of their pipeline so they'll kind of hide it in and use codes that make it look like it's still in discussion or we're waiting for the next review with the client or there's been a management change and this deal is going to come back around if you're a sales leader you've got to really challenge the, those deals that have aged beyond what your average sales cycles are and, and this kind of a dashboard slide will we'll really bring that to the forefront and let you go hone in on those on a, on a one-off basis. So David, let's go to, to the next slide, slide 13. So once you have the dashboard in place, this is going to suggest what kind of sales calendar do we need. And, and we would suggest that, that the companies that have sales calendars win more deals. So it's one thing to have process and, and, and measurement. But having a, a cadence to how you run your sales organization, meaning how often do you do you do pipeline reviews and with whom? When do you do do executive reviews of deals? At what stage and how often do you do that? Who do you measure in the sales organization and that supports the sales organization on a regular basis? So for companies to, to be successful in, in making their number, it's not just the sales team that's involved. We all know that it's it's sales operations, sales support, finance teams legal, marketing, all those groups have impact on opportunities as they're moving through through the sales pipeline. 
So are they involved in your sales calendar as well? Do they participate in, in scheduled pipeline reviews so that they can see the importance of the deals and they can help participate in those that are, are stuck somewhere inside the organization? Um, as the last bullet says, nothing motivates an organization like a deadline, and, and sales calendars are a great, great way to do that. Um, Dan's made a point a number of times with companies that put, put the most important dates for your sales calendar in everyone's Outlook or whatever email and calendar and tool you use. Put it in, in their schedule at the beginning of the year and, and force everyone to work around it. Yes, client important, appointments are, uh, are vital, but make sure that the sales organization knows that these internal meetings are equally vital. Don't overwhelm them with them, but put them out there so that everybody sees, hey, look, every Monday at 8 a.m., I know I've got an internal sales meeting, and they can work their schedules with their clients around that in most cases. So um, that's a great thing to do. Uh, David, let's go to the next slide. And you'll see some examples of sales calendars. Um, we like to look at different activities by different levels in the organization. So sales leadership, um, these are some of the things that they're looking at and the frequency that they're looking at them. Um, down the left column, you know, annually they're setting, they're setting company quotas and goals. Quarterly they're doing top level reviews of divisions or business units or territories. Monthly they're looking at dashboards like what we saw some examples earlier on and they're engaging with marketing to make sure the leads are flowing. They're interfacing with finance to make sure the forecasts are believable. Weekly, they're involved in the most important deals on the pipeline, either early stage to get them to the next point or late stage to help them to close. Sales management is, is going to be more engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with the sales teams, but they still have different activities at an annual, quarterly, and monthly level. It's just a little bit more specific and a little more granular relative to the actual deals in the pipeline. And then the sales execs themselves they're looking at their own individual pipeline, their own individual territory plan. But what you see as you go top to bottom and left to right across a calendar like this is you've got alignment between leadership, management, and the sales rep level at, at every stage, whether it's annual, quarterly, monthly, or, or weekly. So this is, you know, hopefully gives you some helpful examples of things that you want to track on a, a sales calendar basis. So uh, David, let's go to slide 15. So it, as you've listened to what we've talked about relative to how buyers are buying today, what changes you might need to make, what your sales process needs to look like, how you're going to manage and measure the team, one, one area that almost is universal in companies in conversations that 3 Ford has is, yeah, all that's important, but I've got to have leads. If you don't have leads to, to a lot of companies, the rest of that stuff is secondary. So, we wanted to kind of end with this slide before we switch over and Dan starts to talk about the second half of the deck. Lead generation is the ultimate science today. And it, it's, a, it, it's both a technical and a process driven uh, component. And the other point about this that a lot of companies realize very quickly when they try and implement themselves is to make all this work, what you really need are, are fractional pieces of resources to enable each one of these different sections. So the idea of trying to, to hire your own team to make all of these things happen can be daunting and it can be cost prohibitive. The, the good news is, is that not only are services such as marketing automation available as a SaaS solution, so you pay for the level of usage that, that you need and you pay for it on a monthly basis versus a big upfront implementation um, cost, a lot of resources are now available on an as-a-service basis. So we're seeing more and more examples of marketing automation as a service that includes not just the software itself, but bundles of a lot of the resources that are necessary to make it work. So content writers and creators, SEO specialists, search uh, specialists, um, people that can run and execute your campaigns and generate reporting for you, so that really what you're paying for is the, the leads themselves. You're not making, you're, you're not trying to turn your company into an expert at lead generation, you're making the investments you need to get those leads and, and get them when you need them to, to fill the sales pipeline. So we wanted to, to leave this slide uh, in place to, to give everybody a visual of the elements that are, that are important. So it does tie back to that, that refined pyramid we looked at earlier. Um, content is the key to make these kinds of programs work. Inbound means that you've got search working correctly and people are finding you and there's good content on your site once they get there. And outbound means that you have marketing automation in place 
so that you have the ability, once people find you, to message them, to bring them back, to continue to engage them, and to know when those priority shifts have happened in their businesses that, that they now might be a, vi a viable prospect for you. So um, we're going to shift from this to the next slide. Dan is going to take over and talk about um, the, the second half of areas that you need to focus on from a sales change point of view. So Dan, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, one of the things that r really needs to be emphasized as we go through any type of program like this is just like anything else in your business, if you're going to make changes and you want to grow your revenues, you want better lead flow, you want higher revenues, you have to invest in the business. There's no way to do it without making some level of investment. And if you're a marketing officer or chief sales officer, your CEO fully understands that you know, to build more widgets, to have more output, oftentimes second shifts have to be implemented, new plants have to be built, new product lines have to be built. The same goes to lead generation. and making sure that you've got a way to understand what the return on investment might look like and also what the timeline might look like, very, very important because as you start to put plans together, and hopefully the sales officer and the marketing officer are going to work very closely on, on this front so that when they get in front of the, the senior leadership team that needs to sign off on making investments, both organizations are in lockstep relative to how we want, what we're going to do to grow, what the projected returns look like, the timelines when we can expect those returns, and also, you need a stack rank them for time and impact because there are going to be things that you look at and go, you know, I, I really like to go do this, but this, this other item right here, it doesn't require quite as much investment, and I think I can make it happen faster. So make sure that you're not always looking at the, you know, the, the, the brass ring approach of, you know, I want to get the, I want to I want to double or triple my sales if I go do this. Make sure that you're putting some realis realistic timelines around it and also that you're investing in it properly. Next slide, please. Another thing that we're really big advocates of is that you really have to be bold to differentiate. One of the things that you probably hear from your prospects day in and day out is I'm inundated with people calling on me trying to sell me the same thing that, you, that you're selling or I have you know three suppliers that supply this today. You know, being a me too won't get you noticed and so we're not advocating that, that you become arrogant or uh, annoying in the way you, you you message and the way you bring yourself to market, but it's okay to be a little bit bold and, and challenge your marketing organization to do the same thing. It's not just about brand and, and you know, check the box that I, I built some collateral. It's really about how do we start to get enough disruption in the marketplace that we can stop the prospects as they're going through the buying process, get their attention and make them look at us as a viable alternative to their, to their um, problems and, and issues that they're having. So find ways to get in front of them and get their attention and being a me too or sounding exactly like your competition is just not going to get that done for you. So, you know, find ways where your voice sounds completely different than everybody else. Next slide, please. Matt talked a little bit earlier about whiteboarding a sales process and looking for roadblocks and impediments and Many times the barriers to increasing sales, in, in a very dramatic sense, is internal issues that have to be broken down. And if you get a group of salespeople together, get your top five or ten salespeople together and ask them what the three biggest internal issues are, once you sift through the, I don't like my comp plan, or um, you know, I've got to do too much with salesforce.com, once you get past the, the one or two things that typically salespeople complain about, you'll oftentimes find the two or three key things that often are part of a sales process issue that really eats up a lot of their time. And let's face it, we don't have the luxury of going out and doubling our sales staff. We would all like to go do that because I think we'd all make a lot more money, but geometrically increasing your cost of sales to get a small lift in actual revenue is just not in the cards. So we need to find ways to be more productive with the team that we have. And more importantly, compensation is what's going to drive a lot of these behaviors. And, and oftentimes, you'll see misalignment between sales and marketing teams because their compensation programs are completely misaligned. Um, marketing will have um, perhaps the management by objectives. They may have some amount of their bonus or their incentive income tied to lead generation. But once you start to get sales and, and marketing and the rest of the organization, sales operations, opportunity management, and it could even be you know finance and, and treasury functions depending on the type of business that you're in, when you get those compensations aligned, everybody's going to want to pull the rope in the same direction. And it's, 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 it's very fascinating watching how behaviors change and change rapidly when 
compensation is changed based on what the needs of the business are. So, you know, don't be afraid to overpay a little bit, and don't be afraid to make sure that people have common goals and objectives because that's the, where the team aspect of selling will come to play. Next slide, please. This is another area that um, as you start to make investments in sales and marketing to drive higher volumes of qualified leads, realize it's going to take some time to change. Um, lead generation is an iterative process. And when you start a lead generation engine up, it doesn't run at full speed day one. It takes a few cycles for the engine to get up to speed. But once it does, it moves along at a fairly nice clip. But the entire leadership team and the entire company needs to know that it's going to take time for that to happen. And that's why Matt's comments earlier relative to dashboarding is very, very important. Because as long as you can show that the investments that are being made are driving the right kinds of outputs from a measurement perspective, i.e., we're getting more leads, the, the lead conversion rates are better, uh, my sales cycle time seems to be shorter because I'm actually getting in front of the prospect well ahead of an RFP process, et cetera, it's going to take some time for that to happen. But it's also important that you define what that future state is going to look like. So if you want your sales organization and your marketing organization to operate this way in six months, realize it's going to be six months before that happens. And so the first month, don't look at your numbers and go, gosh, we're not where we need to be. What you're looking for are the trend lines behind all those numbers and metrics that indicate that you're moving in the right direction and that you're not going backwards. So once again, whether your CRM system is set up to do this or you have other measurement methodologies that your firm uses to do dashboarding, make sure that you're measuring and monitoring the right things and make sure that it's visible to the entire organization from top to bottom. There's nothing that gets, I think, gets companies more excited at all levels than to see that the quantity of, of sales are increasing, the quantity of leads are increasing, and more importantly, the quantity of new logos coming in from a win, weight, win rate perspective is also increasing. Next slide, please. So uh, to kind of circle back with uh, Matt's comment at the very beginning about the buying process has changed, it's very, very critical that companies change with the times and, em and embrace the new buy process. We even have customers today that um, certain parts of the organization embrace the new methodologies very strongly, and yet sales teams look at the leads that come over and go, gosh, I'm not sure these are really qualified because they don't look and feel like the leads that I used to get or leads that I've been accustomed to, to seeing and, and and working on. So make sure that everybody knows that this is a new process and everybody's got to embrace it and, and manage through that and not just look at it and say, I'm not going to be part of it. I'm going to continue to do it the way I used to. Also, investments have to happen. If you want to grow your sales 15%, it's not going to happen magically. You've got to have a new product line, more salespeople, um, higher efficiency, the sales organization that you have, better upselling and cross-selling. But the reality is you got to make investments if you're going to grow your revenue. And you have to update your sales both internally and externally to stay competitive. We've all got and can probably name people on our sales teams that we look at and say that person you know, probably hasn't changed the way he or she sells or the way they manage their business in quite some time. But you, you really have to make a concerted effort to have a cultural change within your company that embraces a selling process that's built on fact and, and math and science and not on a gut feel that says, I've got a pretty good Rolodex and I think I can close four deals by the end of the year. If you're going to embrace a new process and you're going to invest in it, the entire organization needs to be committed to changing with time. Next slide, please. So we're now going to open it up for some questions and answers. And I know that there's been one or two that have come in. And um, I'm, going to let, uh, I'm going to let Matt uh, take the first one. Yeah, so there's a, a question regarding a, a certain sales methodology. Revenue Storm uh, is the name of it. <clears throat> that I guess we just say this about sales methodologies. <clears throat> There's a lot of really good ones out there, and I don't know that you can go wrong as an organization by finding one that, that looks and feels right to you and, and implementing it. Um, the, the fact is most companies are not operating under any sales methodology per se. At best, it may be pieces of one here and there, you know, as, as sales leaders or operations, sales operations people come into and out of the organization and they bring something with them that they used in another company. Um, so, you know, if, if you're evaluating a sales methodology, be it this one or, the, like we said, there's a lot of really other, other really good ones out there, pick one that feels right, 
implement it and and make sure that everybody that's part of that needs to be part of the process is trained on it and understands the the importance of following the approach so it, it's going to be more than just the sales reps it's going to it's going to require sales operations the proposal teams and pricing marketing you really want everyone to understand what that that selling methodology is and how it applies to their their portion of the process and that they're willing to adhere to it and then lastly you know Dan said this a couple of times look for places where you can tie compensation to following that methodology not ideally not punitively but the other way around so you know the more the more consistency the team gets in using the, the, the methodology the more everyone adheres to it you know maybe you find ways to create bonus opportunities or increment commissions a little bit for for those deals and and use it as more of the carrot approach you know and, and let people start to see the benefits of it versus making it feel punitive that's that's oftentimes the biggest problem with the sales methodologies is is you know they they come across as do this or else kind of a thing and they're almost destined to fail when that's the that's the strategy so that's our thought on that Dan was there anything you wanted to add to to no, that I question think that, I think that covers it very well um, the next question is we, we have a big marketing department marketing organization but they don't see themselves responsible for generating leads thoughts. Um, we, marketing's role in our opinion of marketing's role in lead generation activities for sales is, is much greater today than it was three months, five months, you know, ten months ago, two years ago. Marketing organizations usually have very large budgets. They're, they do spend a lot of time with brand and collateral, but the whole purpose behind marketing is to bring new logo business and new revenues into your firm. And if the actions and activities from the marketing perspective aren't proving that they're doing that, then it's probably time to sit down with the sales and the marketing team and, and jointly look at what makes sense going forward. And we haven't seen a lot of marketing organizations that have been hesitant to be involved in lead generation, but they have been hesitant to sign up for um, revenue ownership, which when you stop and think about it, a, a portion of every new dollar that comes in should have some attribution to marketing. So. If you don't have a marketing team that's helping with lead generation, you know, call a powwow and get everybody together and say, you know, we need to figure out ways to bring more leads into the business. <clears throat> and if it means you have to share information with them from this webinar or others that you've you've seen or other venues, you know, take the time to go do that because you, you just can't continue the, the cold calling and beating your head against the wall, calling on prospects that haven't had a priority shift. They haven't had a status quo, that they're still in a status quo situation the words from the sales organization and quite often anything else that comes out from marketing or from anybody else is going to fall on deaf ears. So the real key is identification of those priority shifts. Um, <clears throat> so here's a, a question. Is it too late to change sales compensation? We already locked our plans. Um, the, the easy answer is it's never too late to change sales comp in a plan year if you're making the plans richer. Um, that's you. You can always find ways, even once you've entered a plan year, to continue to, to find you know additional motivators for people. So a good example might be we're into the year, but as a sales leader, you see that you still have a lot of deals in the pipeline that that you think are stale or or actually dead. Put some put some compensation bonuses if you can do it that way out there for simply cleaning up the pipeline, and and, and tie some some bonus structure to that you're going to be in a much better position as a sales leader if you have a pipeline that you can believe and, and you can present to the rest of the executive team and and the rest of the organization will benefit because they'll know which are the real deals to focus on so that you know that's kind of an easy one and another one that a lot of companies use and, and we're big believers if if you have the ability to influence timing is to put some accelerators to to uh, closing book or booking business earlier in the plan year versus later in the plan year um, the, the kind of the caveat to that is sales doesn't always have the ability to influence the timing of the decision despite what sales managers are, want, want to believe. Um, so it, you know, look carefully at, at what you sell and how you sell. If you do have the ability to influence timing, then by all means put some accelerators in there for closing more deals earlier. If you can't influence timing, what you can often influence would be building qualified pipeline earlier in the plan year. So that's another area to look is is putting some bonuses simply around building the right kind of pipeline with the right clients 
and, and getting it to certain stages. And, and you can do that at the individual level. You can do it at the team level as well. So those are a couple of examples um, of changing comp in mid-year. Um, if, you're, if you're changing it to make it worse, just beware that there's a lot of demotivating um, factors that, that occur when you do that, not just to the sales team, but disgruntled sales reps are going to complain to everybody that will listen within their organization. Um, and you know, if the rest of the company starts to hear that sales is, is unhappy and their, their comp plan is being made worse, they, a lot of people will interpret that as, as a bad sign. So be really careful about, about making a, a compensation plan less lucrative once you get into the year and you've already locked it down. So um, that, uh, that's a good question. We appreciate you asking that one. I think we have about five or ten minutes at the most for a few more. So. Um, we'll just remind you, if you want to get yours in, go ahead and, and, and uh, send it in through the chat panel as quickly as you can. Here's and you want to take one. a look at the next one? Yeah, here's a really good one that just came in. It says, what's the best methodology to forecast revenue when launching a new product or service line? Typically, companies are not patient or realistic when interacting with sales with the sales department when launching new products. That's an outstanding question, and, and we are rabid, and I should emphasize rabid, revenue planners for ourselves and for our clients. You can't build a revenue plan if, for the entire company if you can't sit down and look at revenue either by a product line basis or by a vertical market or channel basis. And there's a lot of different assumptions that go into revenue planning um, as far as the number of, you know, Matt you know, talked about the funnel earlier, so how do you start to get prospects through that funnel? And one of the ways that you can get some patience with the executive team is as you sit down with them and build revenue plans for the year, especially when it's a new product, you can sit down with them and say, okay, if we want to go generate $100,000, which is the target, <clears throat> here's our estimate of the number of people um, across the country that could be potential buyers that we need to start to engage with, interact with, and ultimately start to convert them from um, leads to suspects to prospects to qualified opportunities to priced opportunities to di opportunities with decisions. And there's a very um, linear progression in many cases of that all those sales stages. In fact, we've got some free tools out on the website that you can go download that can help you from a revenue planning perspective look at and do some what-if scenarios that say, okay, well, if my average deal size looks like this and I sell it here and I implement it in this fashion, what can I actually generate from a revenue perspective? Because keep in mind, many companies have a, there's a big delta between when they book a piece of business and when they can recognize revenue. And so if you're being measured on revenue, you've got to make sure that you sell enough of it that you can, you can earn the portion that's needed in the year. Um, conversely, if you are um, selling everything in the last month of the year and the sales team is 100% of their plan, but the company misses their revenue plan because it all got sold so late, there's a real mismatch there. So you know, take the time that when a new, new product comes out and quotas are going to, macro quotas are going to start to be assigned against that, Make sure you've got some good tools and methodologies that says, okay, well, if I'm going to generate $100,000 in net new revenue sales, I've got to have this many leads, and how many of those leads are going to be generated by marketing? How many are going to be generated through the sales organization? What percentage would be generated through trade or through indirect channels if you have reseller or partner channels? So it's, it's a really good question, and it doesn't matter whether it's a new product or you're planning your 2013 or 2014 revenue stream it's important to really get granular on the revenue planning side of it and not just take a swag at it because there's a lot of jobs and, and uh, livelihoods that are, that are at, uh, at stake when it happens that way. Yeah, it's a, it is a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, we, we have a question uh, on the slide we showed the, the new sales funnel. The um, question is how long does it take to implement all these technologies, create the content, and start to see payoff? Um, it takes longer than, than the marketing automation vendors will tell you. Um, <clears throat> what we have found with these programs, and we've implemented a lot of them, they, there is a, a build effect that has to occur. One, you have to get through the learning curve of launching the, the, the program itself, um, which marketing automation in itself is not that complicated. What's complicated is segmenting your database so that you can message to different groups and, and different personas. Um, getting getting enough content onto your website so that you can can run a, a regular cadence of value added messages, not just pushing a bunch of sales collateral at, at your prospects. Um, that that can take a, quite a bit of time, and, and it's often one of the longest the longest poles in the tent. Frankly, is building content. Um, 
learning how to use the data and the analytics, um, it takes a while. The, 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 the plus side of marketing automation is you, you get a tremendous amount of data about your leads. The, you know, call it the downside is you get a lot of data and sometimes it can be overwhelming and, and you know, you can get lost in the amount of it. So it'll take organizations that are new at it a little bit of time to build dashboards that are, that truly are meaningful, that are showing them um, what are actual indicative leads or leads that are, are potentially ready to, to move to the next stage. So all that is, there's learning curve to it. You know, exactly how long it's going to take you, it's, it's a couple of quarters at least before you really get, if you're, if you're very focused at it and you've got a, a good project plan and you've got good resources implementing, it's a couple of quarters at least to get it all up and running and in motion and start to see data. And then count on a couple more quarters to to really fine tune your processes and to get much better at it. If you can stick to that, at the end of a full year, you're going to be very very pleased with where you are, um, and you'll you'll be well set up for your coming year and feel like you've got a good sense of confidence that you're creating leads on a regular basis and and you know the levers to push. So hopefully that helps answer the question and, and doesn't turn you off to the idea of this. You know what we would say is regardless of how difficult it might be, you got you to gotta do it. Marketing automation at this stage of, for B2B companies is something that, that has to be part of your mix. Um, here's one I, we actually did cover a little bit earlier, but let's kind of circle back to it, and that is, should I, be, should I build or, or buy these kinds of processes? And, and Matt pointed out earlier that some of the actions and activities, such as building content, and some of the other pieces that go towards, you know, SEO optimization, et cetera, none of those necessarily are full-time jobs for many companies. And so, you know, hiring three or four incremental resources to go do these tax, tasks and activities, in a lot of cases, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But we do feel very strongly that there needs to be a central ownership, a single point of contact ownership within the company that's responsible for any sort of lead generation or um, demand generation types of activities. But if you're looking for people to help you with content and some of the as the marketing automation software as an example, there's lots of companies out there that can that can help you develop content, provide you tool sets. But one of the things that's important to keep in mind is make sure that you know what your process is going to look like when you start to implement new new tools and new methodologies, because software is you know everybody will tell you that you plug it in it works great, but the reality is make sure you think through your process very very um, deeply before you implement. And then the other piece is keep your keep it simple to start with. Don't try and put too many bells and whistles in any kind of a new program. Build a basic model, get the car running, get it moving down the highway, and over time continue to make it go faster and add some accessories to it. That's the, the probably the best way to do it with the least amount of um, pain within the, within the company. So we have, we have time for one more, and I think this is a good wrap-up question. The question is, you both put out a lot of of suggestions, where do we start if we need to do, you know, a whole lot of things, and you know, generally our answer is rank each one of the projects that that you think you need to do, and put an ROI to each one of them, and and, and at the same time look how fast you think you can get payback. Um, you know, you can't do everything at once because you're also trying to hit a quota and managing your sales teams and and taking care of your current customers, so, you, you know. Look, look at which projects are going to, to be implementable given your current resources, your current budget, which ones will have the, the greatest impact. And, and it's not always the most complex. Sometimes it, it might be, like Dan suggested, pulling the sales team, what are your top three internal challenges, and just simply making some changes to the way you do things. Um, and that might have the quickest and greatest payback. Um, but, but don't try and do everything at one time. Um, you'll, you'll probably throw your hands up in the air and, and you know, stop because it just makes things too complicated. Um, at the same time, don't wait to make changes. You know, as, as we said earlier, um, the buying process has changed dramatically. If, you know, if you're seeing the effects of it in your organization, something does have to change. So the point is, you know, figure out where and, and rank them and get started one at a time, knocking those projects off, and, and you, but have some process to, to how you decide which ones they are. And hopefully that gets you through it quickly and enough that you can see impact and, and um, you know, realize that it's a, a build process and, and you, know, you, you can and should expect continuous improvement as you go forward. So um, 
Dave, I think that that was the last one, and um, I don't know if you have a, a final slide you want to wrap up on, but you know, we wanted to thank the audience for attending today. As Dan mentioned, we have a number of resources that are, are available on our slot, uh, site, 3 4com Go to the resources page. We have over 25 templates, tools, and, and models that are free for download to, to help you manage your sales process and your sales teams. And um, we blog regularly about all the things we talked about here today, too, so you can get a little bit more detail on, on the topics and subjects. So, uh, Dave, we'll turn it back over to you, and, and thank you for the afternoon. Great, great. Thanks. Uh, I just want to thank you guys both for your presentations. I want to thank Matt Smith and Dan Hudson from 3Forward on behalf of the Outsourcing Institute. Thank everybody else for joining and listening today. Uh, again, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with the link to the recorded webinar and presentation slides, also with contact information for Dan and Matt as well. Thanks very much.